It's January 2015 and the EDSAC trustees are meeting in Cambridge for one of their regular updates. Right, um, so you've had my two written reports that basically pick up... The Andrew Herbert, the project manager, brings the meeting up to date. Since many of us were at the opening event, um, what's progressed since then? Um, we're A month or so earlier, Herman Hauser had opened the EDSAC gallery at the National Museum of this Computing really at Bletchley Park for, uh, with a theatrical uh, flourish uh, as a projected uh, image of the 1940s original story, computer uh, dropped so away to reveal the reality of the replica. Ado, I would like to declare this gallery open. <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, congratulations. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. That, was, that was great fun. Uh, for the, yes, uh, yeah. terrific. The, we need to thank David for pushing me to do the coup de theatre. I was convinced, <laughs> I was convinced <laughs> it all wouldn't work and it was far too silly, but uh, it worked spectacularly well. So that was very successful. Um, and those who are there will know we have something on the order of 80 or so chassis in the machine now. About 25 of them are tested and working, and gradually they're being knitted together. The re this exponential should be miles over there. That's right. So and I, it's this such a short one. Well, it's it's a good question, that's what yeah. I'm trying to sit here and look yeah, but at. <laughs> but connecting the racks and chassis together has thrown up some problems. The reset is about number one, two, three or four. Yes. So is there some kind of capacitor? If it was left on its own. Yeah, it should be reset? how long? About one and a half milliseconds. Milliseconds. About, about what, a is tank it, what is it on that? Well, it looks about one and a half microseconds. The problems are probably similar to those facing the pioneers in the late 1940s. What, what are your colleagues up to here? Well, we've got a problem <coughs> with the so-called flip-flop circuit, which is a kind of monostable, um, whereby a pulse comes in and sets the flip-flop to be in a set state, uh, in this case corresponding to one of the order digits, um, and it should stay set until we consciously come along with a different pulse and reset it. This pulse is about a microsecond wide, millionth of a second wide, and we want to remember that we've had that pulse. And we remember it by having a flip-flop circuit, and this circuit is shown on this trace, where it's basically unset, and then when the pulse comes along, it's set. And it stays set. So we've got either a high level or a low level, set or unset. It should stay in this state until we come along with a separate signal and unset it. Unfortunately, it's spontaneously going back by itself without any incoming signal. So there's a fault somewhere in this which is causing it to go back unexpectedly. So it's a little bit puzzling. Either the design of the circuit isn't quite right, or we've got a faulty component in the circuit in this actual chassis. But that, that, ex that particular issue of connecting the clock to the store um, led Chris to having to re-choose the values on the flip-flop circuits. Um, so there's a lot this, of noise pickup. Is, is this because problem. we didn't know the original values? Correct. Yeah, right. So we, 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 we have a skeleton basis. diagram with no, vi no values. <laughs> We'll never know the, the, whether the ones that are working for us were actually the ones that were used originally. Well, we have some well, diagrams, don't we? Of the, of yes, the, no, oh, yes, I should have said now that one of John Locas, the new treasurer. Last year, one, original yeah. circuit diagrams <laughs> had been rediscovered by John Locas. cleared out, but they hadn't cleared out all the cupboards. He'd worked and in the laboratory after the original EDSAC had been dismantled. However, I had a re-look after this flip-flop problem and found one drawing of the 30, of the 20, 21, one drawing of the 21, uh, with two of the old-fashioned flip-flops on. So I've now got component values corresponding to what they ended up with before they switched to these vice labels, and that seems to work. More forensic evidence has recently come from an EDSAC chassis discovered in America, apparently bought when EDSAC was auctioned off in the 1950s. This chap bought three racks because he wanted the metal racks to turn into bookshelves. <laughs> and he gave the chassis to various friends who presumably you know, might want to recover some electronics. And this chap had a chassis and it's followed him around the world. He now lives in Pennsylvania. Certainly in Pennsylvania as a state. Um, Allentown. And Allentown, thank you. Um, yeah, it's AT&T town. AT&T town, there you go. Um, and he shipped it back to us. It is amazingly tatty. 
It clearly has just been sitting out in garages getting rusty over the years. Chris Burton is in charge of the so circuit design. The new chassis is different from this surviving EDSAC chassis from Cambridge. The, the example we took from the lab that you used to design our chassis 01 actually has some flaws. And so I wonder if there was a prototype chassis 01 which were the ones that ended up in the museums. There's the chassis one which we've got, which is the improved working design in the machine, which is basically a crisp tidy up of the prototype. And then there's 1A, which is yet a later improvement. Um, so it just shows what a moving target we're chasing. Um, do, do you suppose that the original one with the flaws was the one that Wilkes built to test the short delay line with the counter? Could easily have been could easily have been a test chassis or mm. whatever. And you know the picture we used to get the back of the clock and digit pulse yes. generators? Yes. I think it's that chassis turned round, because as John Sanson's pointed out, all the cables are going down. And of course you'd want them going up on a real machine. Yes. So, yeah, more historical yeah. things appear. Um, if EDSAC was auctioned off, you know, my sort of joke nightmare is we announce the grand opening and someone says, oh, come and see mine. I've had it in the garage for the last <laughs> 70 <laughs> years. <laughs> um, well, Woods is always very proud that he, when he auctioned off the EDSAC, raised more money than it had cost right. to build. I think, think it was it mainly oh, due to the you? rise in the uh, price of mercury. Uh, mercury yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't realise it had been auctioned off. I, uh, well, sorry, I, I didn't right. know it was an auction. Yeah, I, I, I just scrap, picked up and it had been scrapped, had an image of, you know, just gone to the corporation tip or something. The other big area is the delay line store. Nickel delay lines will replace the original mercury units to form the working memory of the replica, and they're in the hands of Peter Linnington. We're still in the state that Peter Linnington has working short delay lines, so we could go into manufacture of those, but is um, still struggling a bit with the long delay lines, but is making progress. In some ways, I'm not too anxious about that, because if we get the rest of the machine running and we use the um, little modern circuit car delay line simulators that we've got, that's, that's fine. Um, and the store can be a sort of phase two thing in that kind of way. Um, and Peter being Peter enjoys having fun with this stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm basically the engineering knowledge of how to make the delay lines has been lost. There are plenty of samples you can look at. But you know, quite why the design ended up the way it did and, and some of the ins and outs of how you whirled the fingers to the wires. Um, some of the issues of precisely how you support them and so forth, and the precise grades of the metal uh, hasn't been written down. And so Peter's essentially researched the manufacturing process. And the, the, the scientific aspects were all fairly straightforward. That was in the literature. Um, mm. But the actual manufacturing has, has had to be re recovered. There's, there's some interesting papers, I think, to come out of his work. And what about the mercury delay line? As yet untouched, I see that definitely as a a thing we will do as a sort of I, I, thought, I thought we were going to have at least a, a, a little one for a register or whatever. I would like to, but I'd like, I need to get the nickel delay lines working first. Okay. So I've got a store, and then given the way the store is connected, it will merely be a matter of plugging the mercury one in once we've got one. Okay, so nobody's, so working, nobody's working Nobody's working. Nobody's working on that. I think Peter would like to work on that. Okay. Um, they, the best path for that would be to strip down and then find the appropriate seals and so forth and get one of the surviving ones. But we have surviving again. ones. We have a surviving one from the computer lab. So we need permission to reactivate it. The original funding from benefactors is running low. Yeah, I don't have a pressing need for cash probably for the next six months or so. Um, but I don't think what we got in the bank will see us through. Is this a good time to have a sort of um, public fundraising? Because apart from getting a bit of money in, it's um, also a very nice way of getting more people involved in this. So more money's needed and there's a suggestion of using local donors or a fundraising website like Just Giving. The computer was built in Cambridge, but the replica will be at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. The replica will be fully working sometime in 2016. And, and, and I, I would have thought that warrants a, a major event. And the plan is for it to be officially opened by a celebrity. I think you should be thinking about that, because in, if you're thinking of an event, I think you should be thinking of spring 2016. And if you want a particular sort of VIP, you could start asking for one now anyway. Well, exactly. Yes. How would you put this forward? Would it come from you, Harlan, are you suggesting? Well, I was wondering whether maybe Boris would be a more appropriate person, because this is, 
uh, you know, our vice chancellor, because this is a uh, this is clearly the first Cambridge computer that we're very proud of. Mm -hmm. But the question is, should we seek also to have a distributed opening in the sense of lots of... Yeah, there, but, you know, you also want to create an atmosphere of, of the event. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and for mm -hmm. that, <coughs> marquee means we need a marquee. Yeah, I think yeah. a marquee in the car park is a great idea, because people yeah. then... But we've cast it, we've cast it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah but... Mm. <laughs> Neither webcasting nor uh, a video link with a computer lab gives yeah. you the, the atmosphere. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, you know, no. I think it's a good thing to do, which we should yeah. do anyway. Yeah. But we also ought to create a, 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 an atmosphere okay. of occasion. Yeah. I'm, I'm not being serious, but how about an antiques roadshow in the sense that people are encouraged to bring computing artifacts and there will be experts ah, on, ah, on hand to. Particularly in the bits of Ed Sack. I never knew I've got an Ed Sack. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's 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 a yeah. very worthwhile idea, actually. Yes. Yeah. So why don't we talk to the new TNOSC management yes. about them, as it were, hosting the antiques roadshow. Yes. Their, their volunteers can do the. Oh, I recognise one of these. It's a so and so. Yeah. Bit. That they they could run that part. That's of it. a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. And that makes something for them. Um, yes. 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 You've got to have an event for the volunteers. I think. Of yes. their own. Like, yeah. a, like a damn good dinner or something. Yes. Probably their spouses. And their spouses. And, and their spouses. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. spouses. That's right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good. It's coming together. The computer itself is an important new exhibit for the museum, but no less important is the fact that the original EDSAC team under Morris Wilkes led the world by devising the whole process of programming in the late 1940s. The EDSAC had begun to work in May 1949 and we had developed a system of programming based on the use of a library of subroutines. The film was made for the first joint computer conference held in Philadelphia in December 1951. And it was, I think, the first film showing the operation of a stored program computer to be made. It's slowly becoming clear that there's a new role for the project once the machine is running. Not only did we build this fantastic thing when it worked, but we then built a computing service. Now, oh, it might be, might, might be difficult to put forward. No, I, 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 I think that's but the But that, that's what EDSAC yeah. was. And that's the key story, yeah. the, the first real use of computing. You know, it, it rang in the digital age. Martin Campbell Kelly joins the meeting by speakerphone. Hello. Oh, Hello, Martin. Uh, we're all assembled here, those of us who are here. Would you like to sort of introduce your paper to us? But the EDSAC is most famous not not because it was the first tactical stored program computer but actually because of its programming system so for example that's why it would be known in the states so i think that's that's what we should celebrate if we have this machine it's obviously going to make a great sort of static exhibit but we could also because it use it as a real a machine to really program uh, so that people could see what it was like to do programming in the 1950s so under A, I've listed the, the hardware things that we need to consider to kind of make it into a machine that you can program in practice. <coughs> if you want to have a, a really as close, authentic an experience as, uh, as we can manage, wouldn't the proper way of inputting uh, somebody's um, program be through the a paper tape reader? So the only thing you'd, you'd need is a remote paper tape punch that um, spews out the, the paper tape into the paper tape reader, or is that... I think that would be the nice way to do it, and it, it would be a nice souvenir for them to take away as well if they have some actual physical tape. Um, we'll need, for example, a photoelectric tape reader, um, because the mechanical one is really going to be too slow, and I suspect it'll be too unreliable if it's reading a very long program. EDSAC used five-hole punched paper tape for input and a teleprinter for output. Martin's suggested list also includes a telephone dial for dialing in a number while the machine is running, and some way of displaying the monitor tubes which show what's going on inside the computer's memory. The way to do that might actually be as simple as having a, a, a TV camera on the monitor uh, that can then be sort of shown large in, right at the front of the machine so they can see its internal actions. He also wants a filing cabinet containing the subroutine library pioneered by David Wheeler himself. Students who aspire to programming the machine itself can refine their programs using an online simulator. Um, if we're going to encourage people to, 
to write programs. My expectation is that it'd probably bring them to us on a USB stick. So we either need a direct, we need something to convert that into paper tape for them, uh, or else actually just being able to put a USB straight into the machine. If you're an EDSAC programmer, you didn't see what you were typing on paper or a screen. You typed blind on a tape, and then you typed it blind again and ran them through a comparison. If they're identical, you assumed what you had on the tapes was what you intended. Yeah. If they weren't, you stared at the paper tape and selected the characters. To, there's a three-way switch. <laughs> so you could select from either tape or type a new character in. Um, you did an EDSAC 2 as well. There you go. Um, so, yeah. Um, one question is: Would you want to recons? Would you want to have that experience available for the preparation? Um, building some sort of device into which you can plug a USB stick, or you send it an email, and oh, any kinds of mechanisms to produce five-hole tape, you would need to interface a Raspberry Pi or a PC to a mechanical punch. Um, and I don't think it would be an impossible task to do that for some of the punches that TNMOC have got a lot of. They've got a huge number of the Westrix punches mm -hmm. that come more from the kind of 1900, early 903 age. I think there are Creed punches there too, which are, um, are five hole only. So in principle, it's, it's doable to produce, to have a device that accepts modern media and produces five hole tape. 2016 is when you start to build the service then? Yes. Yeah. In some sense, 2016 is our May the 6th, 1949. We can demonstrate it, and a year on from that is our November 1949 when we say to the world, come and play. On Sundays they have to wear period costumes. <laughs> <laughs>